In the city of Boston, the role of white people is to save black people. It's manifested in the organizing work. It's manifested in the human services. It's manifested in the politics. And the only thing we're really good for is to vote for people or to be recipients of services. Change is not done by one individual. It requires a community. In order to be effective agents of change, the first thing and the most important thing that you have to do is you have to tell the truth. You have to be honest about the issue, honest about the suffering. And you can't care about what the power lead thinks. You have to have the power to stand up and speak for yourself. Real Talk is going to be about helping communities of color, helping you get the skills that you need to rebuild your communities, to strengthen your communities, to be more effective citizens, to be the change agents that your communities and that your children need and expect, and to take ownership of your community. Real people, real time, Real Talk. I'd just like to thank Horace Small and David Corby of the Union of Minority Neighborhoods for inviting me to talk about HIV AIDS um, in, among African Americans today. I thought um, I'd start with giving you a little bit of just general information. Here on the slide you see is a timeline of um, epidemics throughout history. Um, and if you look, I don't know, on, on the slide here, you can see where I have the arrows. That bubble represents the number of people who have died so far uh, from HIV AIDS. Really, there's only been two epidemics that have been more lethal or deadly than HIV in world history. In 2014, 37 million people uh, are living with HIV. Um, including, as it says here, 2.6 million children. And that's an HIV, an average HIV prevalence rate of 0.8%. One of the things you can see in this chart uh, is the areas of the world that are most affected. Um, and I don't know how well you can see the colors here, but you can see that Sub-Saharan Africa is the part of the world that is right now most affected by the epidemic. You can see where the United States here is, uh, in, is in the purple. It's uh, aggregated with Western and Central Europe and North America. And so that's represented by that little purple segment there. In the United States, for you know, accidental reasons, the epidemic started in the gay male community. And still today, more men than women are affected or have HIV. Uh, infections in the U.S. today. But in other parts of the world, this is an illness or disease that affects women more than men. Um, the reasons for that we can go into. One reason is that women are actually more biologically vulnerable for a variety of reasons. But one of the things you see here, women represent women and girls, the purple line and the greenish colored line represents men. And also at the bottom, you see HIV prevalence by percent. You also see, remember I said that the overall worldwide prevalence is 0.8%. But in some age groups in South Africa, the prevalence among young women is as high as you know, 35%. Uh, for women between the ages of 30 and 34, it's, it's quite high. Almost every age category, more women than men. Um, or have HIV. In the United States, right now, the CDC estimates that about 1.2 million people are living with HIV, um, but that about one in every seven uh, people are unaware that they have HIV. You can again see how it breaks down which uh, populations are most affected. So uh, on the left, you see new HIV infections by race and ethnicity. 
Uh, the yellow band there uh, represents black and African Americans. And you can see that there they have the highest uh, profile, highest burden of HIV, 46% um, and actually now it may even be a little bit higher, but 46% of those infected with HIV are black or African American, while blacks represent about somewhere between 12 uh, to 13% of the US population. So this is a community that disproportionately, unfortunately, is repre represented. This is a chart of the leading causes of death by age group for black women in the United States. And I don't know if you, you can see those little um, brackets, but HIV is among the 10 leading causes of death for black women in the US. And this is significant because for no other group of women is HIV or AIDS in the, uh, among the top 10 causes of death. It is for black men, for gay and bisexual men, but not uh, for any other group of women. About 10 years ago, if you looked at an earlier chart, in the age group, um, I think it was the age group um, 35 to 44 there, uh, AIDS was the highest leading cause of death. So it's the, the picture's gotten a little bit better, but uh, it's not you know, improved enough. For women ages 20 all the way to 54, uh, HIV AIDS is still uh, among the leading causes of death. This gives you a sense of how the epidemic breaks down uh, in terms of state by state. And if you look the, where the epidemic is now concentrated, um, the dark blue, looks maybe bluish purple in this diagram, is where the uh, highest prevalence is. And um, if you can see, Massachusetts is purple, so that's sort of in the middle. But the states with the highest concentration of HIV uh, now in AIDS, um, is now you can see in the, in, in the southeast, a little bit in the northeast. Um, and then the red states are also have uh, high numbers of people infected with HIV relative to other areas. The CDC has a, a more recent report, 2014 surveillance report, breaks this down by cities. And um, the cities that we see that are most, uh, have the highest prevalence of HIV today are also those cities, both urban and rural areas, that have high populations of African Americans. Um, so for example, the city today with the highest prevalence of HIV is Baton Rouge in Louisiana, and the city that I live in, Miami, is a city that ranks second in prevalence of HIV. You can see that again, compared to South Africa, right, um, that men are in the, among the high groups with the highest rates of HIV. Uh, white MSM, MSM stands for men who have sex with men. So white and black men who have sex with men are among the groups most affected. Um, and then the third highest group would be Hispanic Latino men. Um, but then right under that we have black heterosexual women. So one of the things we might ask is how did the epidemic move into the uh, population of black heterosexual women? One of the things we know is that most new infections uh, among African American women, as it says here, about 87% are attributed to heterosexual contact. There seems to be a connection between the HIV AIDS crisis and the African American community and um, the phenomenon of mass incarceration. Exactly during the years that the HIV AIDS crisis was taking off and, and, and skyrocketing in the US in the decades of the 80s and 90s, the US prison population was also exploding. Um, so um, the NAACP reports that from 1980 to 2008, the number of people incarcerated in, in America quadrupled from roughly a half a million to 2.3 million people. Um, today, the US is 5% of the world population and has 25% of world prisoners. Um, another st statistic that's uh, somewhat uh, quite depressing is that African Americans are incarcerated at nearly six times the, rates, uh, the rate of whites. And I've actually seen some data that suggests it's now perhaps six to seven times the rate of whites. 
Um, our prison population in the United States is over 90% male, so that's why it's important, though, although obviously women go to prison um, and face some of the same vulnerabil vulnerabilities there as men, but our prison population is overwhelmingly male, so that's why um, the researchers are focusing on the uh, dynamics of incarceration among male inmates. The United States, by the way, also um, right now has imp uh, imprisons more, a higher percent of its population than any other country in the world, including Russia and China, and something like five times uh, the rate uh, compared to other Western democracies. There's uh, a, a significant amount of sex that occurs that is non-consensual or you know, involves sexual assault. It's a problem that's largely been ignored. It's getting a little bit more attention now because our definitions of rape, our legal definitions of rape are actually changing so that we um, recognize more cases of sexual assault as actually rape. And so for a long time, we, we, in our society, we imagined rape as a crime where the typical victim was a woman and the typical assailant was a man. Um, prison rape is a phenomenon that can occur between or among inmates and between inmates of the same sex. And that kind of violence among prisoners wasn't always understood to be a form of rape. According to the Bureau of Justice Statistics, um, around 80,000 women and men a year are sexually abused in American correctional facilities. Um, that number is um, probably, as it says here, is certainly subject to underreporting uh, through shame or victim's fear of retali retaliation. We know that rape in general is a very underreported crime. You can imagine in a prison context, it's even going to be more underreported or less reported. Since inmates are not supposed to have sex in prison, since sex is prohibited, um, most jails and prisons do not provide inmates with condoms. Less than 1% of U.S. correctional facilities provide condoms to inmates. You have a population with a high prevalence of HIV and AIDS where there is some amount of consensual sexual contact and some amount of non-consensual sexual contact no access to condoms. I think these are conditions in which most people would expect that any kind of infectious disease, including HIV, is likely to spread. They have their freedom taken away, right? That's their punishment. They're not supposed to have their health or life put at risk because they are neglected or not uh, properly cared for. Another part of the picture that helps explain why HIV AIDS kind of hit the African-American community very hard. It has to do with access to health care. The Kaiser Family Foundation reports, while many blacks, 81%, are diagnosed and linked to care, only 34% remain in regular care, and fewer are prescribed antiretroviral therapy. Only one in five blacks are virally suppressed compared to 26% of Latinos and 30% of whites. I showed you before that the virus now, the HIV epidemic, is now getting concentrated in the southern states. And it's the southern states that um, during this period of, um, as the Affordable Health Care Act, right, Obamacare is getting implemented, it's the southern states that did not accept um, the Medicaid expansion that, um, that many states around the country did. And so you can see these um, states, the brown states, where again, we're seeing the um, highest prevalence of HIV. These states, it's more difficult because they didn't accept Medicare, Medicaid extensions, it's more difficult for low-income people to get health insurance. And without health insurance, many people can't get access to health care. There is a connection, as many public health studies are showing, between mass incarceration and the, the, the exploding explosion of the HIV AIDS in black communities. Then we obviously need to address mass incarceration, which is a very tall order. Um, but we do need to address the numbers of people that we are putting behind bars, and many people uh, are beginning to think about this. But we also need to think about what we can do right now to address the conditions in our prisons that are allowing uh, people uh, to become infected 
or when they become infected, not to get be able to access treatment. Now, if they've managed while they're in prison to get antiretroviral drugs, the question is, will they be able to continue getting those medicines once they're outside of prison, right? And one of the things we find is there's often a break in treatment when someone is released from prison. Uh, it may take several weeks or even months before they can get signed up and access health insurance and then get the medicines that they need. Unfortunately, um, HIV, uh, when you're on, you know, when you're virally suppressed, right, the virus doesn't replicate. But as soon as somebody gets off, a, off of ART, gets off of the drugs, the virus begins to replicate very quickly. And even with a few days being off one's medicine, uh, someone can become infectious again. And so this is a moment where we see some interventions that are possible. Um, one intervention is to test more inmates before they're released from prison, um, not just when they enter, but before they're released so that they know their HIV status, and then to provide them with an adequate supply of, uh, of, of antiretroviral drugs, a supply that will last them until they can access health care uh, once they're back in their communities. Most of the STD testing that's done in prison is voluntary, uh, and so only done on inmates who volunteer, um, and it's not clear how, you know, what the uh, prison, the correctional system is doing to try to get more inmates to sign up and get tested and to, um, ex to get the information out to them about why that's important. By focusing on these larger um, sort of structural environmental factors that uh, make some communities more vulnerable and more at risk for HIV and AIDS, uh, we, you know, can accomplish a lot in trying to, um, to get sort of a handle on this very um, serious crisis, health crisis in black communities. All right, we'll stop there and uh, see if there are any questions. Thanks. Hi, I'm Horace Small, Executive Director of the Union of Minority Neighborhoods, and I want to thank Professor Lori Schrag from Florida International University for that stellar presentation of information that communities of color need in order to address issues that impact their lives. That's what Real Talk is supposed to be about. Real Talk is to talk about real issues in real time that are impacting people of color in communities not just in Boston but all over the United States. We've been working very hard to make information and to make knowledge available so that people can make the logical decisions. And in this particular issue of HIV infection, this is something that all of us have to, have to begin to start paying attention to. We hope that you take the time to join Professor Schreg, Attorney General Maura Healy and others to begin to start the process of organizing. The way that this issue got addressed in the 70s, the 80s, and the 90s was that people of goodwill started to do the heavy lifting that needed to be done to make this issue, to put this issue prominently front and center into the eyes and the hearts of our elected leadership and officials. So we hope that you join us and hopefully other experts who have ideas and hopefully black women who are committed to talking to other black women, who are committed to talking to the mayor, who are committed to talking to the governor, who are committed to talking to city council and the legislators, to begin to start looking for solutions to a problem that has a phenomenal impact on the lives and the character of our communities. Thank you. To stay up to date with all things UMN, like the Real Talk series, follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, or check out our website, 